How's everybody doing? Moms, you look fantastic. You look, be look beautiful. Yes. Good, good response. Cindy, my wife, you look beautiful. My mother-in-law is here today. She looks beautiful. Yes. And good to have my nephew and his wife and girls here with us from Kansas. Good to have them all here. All the girls look beautiful. I got... I, I got to share with you, uh, Mom, thank you for, for all the investments that you make in your kids' life. Now, I know your kids don't always appreciate it like, like they should or we should, uh, but I read this in the Douglas County Sentinel newspaper this week. It says, little Johnny brought his report card, which had all D's and F's, home from school. His parents were lecturing him, and Johnny interrupted to explain that everyone in his class did poorly, not just him. Now, they reminded him that his friend down the street, little David, had all A's and B's. But that's different, Johnny reasoned. His parents are smart. <laughs> so, so, Mom, we know that you're uh, investing heavily and still getting blamed for a lot of the things that are going on. But uh, anyway, I just thought that was pretty good. Take your Bibles and your notepad, um, whatever you're taking notes on, maybe open up your phone to your notes app. I, I want to give you a biblical, uh, theological foundation today for this series as we get started. There, there's a question that we can't seem to shake as humans. And the question is, who am I? Who am I? And I think it's a question that at some point, probably most young mommies will ask. Because when life is consumed by kids and schedules and endless mommy tasks, it's like, I know, I know I'm a mom, but who else am I? And so it gets kind of cloudy in all that. And when we don't understand who we are, there's often an attempt to create or project a different person because we see, we see so many images that are touched up, polished up, or made up of people that are living their best life. Have you noticed all the images online are just people living their best life? You don't get the other images usually. For instance, look at this image of motherhood in, on the cover of Parent Magazine. I wonder how long it took to get the baby smiling like that. <laughs> no, notice that everything in the image is new, it's neat, it's orderly, it's clean, and it kind of appears high-end also, doesn't it? But what, what stands out to me are the words that are on the cover. They, they chose these words carefully, I'm sure. Mom, boss, energy. The juggle is real, but you've got this. And the, in, in the upper left-hand corner, I don't know if you can read it, but it says, sweet treats with half the sugar and plan a family trip that you'll never forget. She's a mom, she's a boss, and she can eat whatever she wants and take unforgettable family trips. The identity statement is obvious, isn't it? Hey, mom, you're meant to have it all. And I'll just join in with that on Mother's Day. <laughs> but how many know that's not real life? And that's not the way it is. So, so maybe this image is a little bit more accurate for you, I'm not sure. I don't know, maybe. The, the, parents, the parents' magazine cover is only an image. This is probably a little more real life. Yeah, just leave that up for a minute. Just absorb that. I know you, you, you left that for just a few minutes to come to church today, but you're going back home to that. <laughs> but I want to encourage you before you go back home. <laughs> But this, this right here is where God's word comes to the rescue. God's word, how many of you know God's word is God's answer book for us, for our lives? The big question is going to be, do you accept it? The big question is, do you believe it's God's word for our lives? For instance, image determines how you view yourself. It determines how you view others. Your image of yourself determines how you view the world. And these determine how you view your life and how you're going to live your life. And all of that really, really matters. And so as we talk about image and we talk about identity today, this is where Genesis 1 is very, very helpful. This is going to be our key text for this entire four-week series and for our time together today. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 is where we're going to read, open, or click your Bibles open. It's coming up on the screen. And those of you online today, thank you for joining with us. It says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image and our likeness, and let them have dominion over the flesh of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. It, it tells us there are creeps on the earth. 
No, that's not what it says. I just, it just came to me as I was reading that. Verse 27, so God created man in his own image, in the image of God. This is where we get the phrase, right here. This is where we get the phrase imago Dei. Imago Dei is Latin for image of God. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God, Imago Dei, he created him, male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Now before we can ever understand who we are meant to be, we must first know what it means to be created in the image of God. And this word today, I'm telling you, it is for every mom. And every mom that's watching online, it is for, really, it is for everyone. It is for our kids. Our kids need this. Mom and dad, take some notes and go home and reinforce this with your kids. Our kids need this. Our youth need this. Our young adults need this. We need this because what God says about this is completely countercultural. This secular world is lying to you about image and identity and who you are meant to be and who you are. This world is lying to you about who you are. So lean in today and lean in for this series. I hope you won't miss any week. Sir, sir, you need this as well. Because how you view God is how you view yourself. It also changes everything about how you treat your kid's mom. How you view yourself changes how you handle people out in the business community how you handle people out in education and government and the marketplace and all the different places you are, how you view yourself, how you, how you see how God sees you right. determines everything. I'm not overstating this because understanding and embracing this truth really does change everything. Let's start right here. Write this down. What does the biblical concept of image mean? I'm gonna walk you through this from a very foundational standpoint. What does the biblical concept of image mean? Saying that all humans are made in the image of God is a pro provocative truth claim today, especially in a world where a plethora of identities are offered. But not just offered, they're even customizable now. Now, without diving in too deep just yet, we're gonna go deeper in this, in this series. But let's just touch on gender for a moment. One recent list on healthline.com shows there are 68 terms that describe and define various gender identity and expressions. Now, let me just ask you, how confusing and chaotic is that? And the man-made list is growing every single day. 68 options and growing. But God tells us the truth about this. Always remember this, if you're taking notes, the designer is the definer. The designer is the definer, and God is not the author of confusion. Actually, God brings clarity to all of this. So what we're doing today is just simply bringing clarity. Say this with me, God brings clarity. God brings clarity. The, enemy brings the enemy brings confusion. But God's word brings clarity to who I am. Jesus said this, he said this in John 17, verse 17. He said, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. We are set apart, we are sanctified by God's truth. We are sanctified, everything is clarified by God's truth. So let's dive into this truth and uh, try to understand what does it mean to be human created in the image of God? What does that mean? I want us to look back at Genesis chapter one and in verse 27 we see the crescendo, I think, of the creation narrative in Genesis one verse 27. It says, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. Do I need to read that again? Okay, I will. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and fe female, he created them. Nothing else in all creation is made in the image of the triune God. Only you and me. Only men and women, male and female. Only babies in their mother's womb are created in the image of the triune God. Mom, think back to the moment when you first held your little child, your little baby, a life created in the image of God. I'm sure you had many thoughts and emotions that came into your mind and came over you at that time when you first looked at that little baby. Maybe one was, maybe it wasn't the thought that this, this is the image of God. This child was created in the image of God. Or maybe when you adopted your first child, the first time you saw them, and so to line up our speech with scripture, 
You and I and our children don't bear the image of God. We don't have the image of God. No, we are the image of God, created in his image. Somebody say Imago Dei. We are the image of God created in his image. There's a wonderful truth that as we stay in scripture, Psalm 139, I think it should be celebrated on Mother's Day 2022 because in a culture where individualism and personal freedom and personal choice usually wins the day now in America and where morality remains subjective, it's not. Morality is absolute in scripture. But the psalmist tells us this in Psalm 139, verse 13. For you formed my inward parts, speaking to God. You formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. My intricately woven body, designed by God, made by God, in the image of God, not just a mass of tissue, but created in the image of God from the very moment of conception. God was forming and creating us into the image of God. That is not the secularist worldview, but that is a biblical foundational view of Imago Dei. Your eyes, verse 16, your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book was written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. God had every day of your life written in his book before you were born. Every day of your life written in his book before you were born. Aren't you glad your mom chose for you to be born and to live out those days according to the will of God for your life? And yet our laws have prevented that since 1973 for over 63 million children to live out those days that were written in his book before they were ever born. I'm not here to go into depth about that. I'm here to establish a biblical foundation for Imago Dei. And listen, that biblical foundation speaks to all of this. It speaks to all those things that we seem to wrestle with. Listen, there are just some things we shouldn't be wrestling with as people of God, as Christians, as people that sit with the word of God in our hands that we can read and we can say what God says about us. God, the great I am. God Almighty declares who I am, and he declares when I came to be. So I am who I am, because the I am tells me who I am. So let's take this further. Can I go a little bit further? To be created in the image of God sets us apart from every other creature. It means I am human. Follow me here. If you read in Genesis 1, you'll get used to hearing that God created various things according to their kinds. Somebody say, according to their kinds. If you've read through Genesis 1, you've seen this over and over again. For instance, trees, plants, according to their kind, sea creatures, birds, according to their kind, livestock, and so on, according to their kinds, points to the fact that for all the diversity of God's creation, there are recognizable groupings or families. For instance, there are many different kinds of birds, but they're all recognizably from the bird family for their kind. You can see it in all different groupings of animals and plants. My grandson, in fact, uh, Jaron and his girlfriend, Jordan, just bought a dog to share. Now, of course, they don't live together because they're not married. Just thought I'd slip that in right there. (laughs) Just making sure we're clear. But they share a dog. Now, if you're gonna have a dog, I think sharing a dog is a really good plan. Yeah, yeah, I think sharing a dog is not a bad plan. It's kind of like, it's kind of like grandkids. You get to have them over and enjoy them and send them back to who you're sharing them with. I mean, there's, I don't know. I, now, now, Jaeger there looks a little bit, uh, he, he's part German shepherd and part wolf. But he's a very, he came over to Papa's house the other day. He's a very sweet little puppy dog. I really pray he stays that way. I, I, But he was born and he looks according to his kind. Am I right? Looks, doesn't look much like German Shepherd. It's a little scary. 
but he was born according to his kind. And that phrase, according to their kind, repeats 10 times in that first chapter of Genesis. 10 times. So then you're reading it, according to his kind, according to his kind. And then all of a sudden, the rhythm is broken. Like in verse 27, when God creates man. It kind of makes you sit up and take note. What's going on here? Because man is not made according to his kind or anything else's kind except God's kind. Humans are made in the image of God. The truth is picked up. This, this, this message is also in the New Testament, like Luke chapter 3, where the first man, Adam, is described as the son of God. Acts chapter 17, which says that you and I are God's offspring. We're God's offspring. Chapter, James chapter 3 tells that you and I were made in the likeness of God. And because of Imago Day, we're to follow in the family business, if you will. We're to live out the will of God. We're in the image of God. We're created in the image of God. We are the image of God, so we are to live out our lives in the image of God and follow his created order and his plan. We're commanded to look after. We're commanded to maintain and cultivate his creation. We have a royal calling as God's representatives in the world because of Imago Dei. Now, I want you to lean in here. I want you to listen to Psalm 8 in light of what I just said. The following words are supremely true for Jesus, but they're also true for those who are made in God's image. Psalm 8 verse 4 says, What is mankind that you are mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them. You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet, all flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. So it's an extraordinary privilege as humans to be made in God's image. But it's also extremely humbling, I think, because it calls us to live a higher way of living. And, and it calls us to a higher way of thinking. I also think it calls us to a higher way of, of behavior. It calls us to live life for God and with God because he is our perfect and holy and loving heavenly father. We just sang about it. I am who God says I am. We just sang that. I'm a child of God. I'm a child of God. Yes, you are. Live that way. Oh, I just like to sing it that way. No, live that way. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. I think most all of us just said that a few minutes ago. You're that way on Monday. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a child of God. Represent. I want to live for God. Then let's live for God. Right. It calls us to see ourselves differently. Yes. I am who God says I am. I'm not who you think I am. I'm not who my mama thinks I am. I am who God says I am. In other words, I have significance because God says I do. Maybe you grew up in a very dysfunctional home. You grew up in a very difficult environment where nobody told you you were valuable. Maybe your mother, maybe your father, maybe someone treated you very, very poorly as a child. And maybe you left that home not realizing that you were created in the image of God and that you are valued. I want you to hear this pastor tell you today, God loves you, you were created in the image of God and you are valuable and you're significant in the eyes of God. He sees you, you're a child of his. I'm made by God, for God, in God's image, for God's purpose. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I think maybe we just need to say that right now. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Look at the person next to you and say, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. We need to be able to tell somebody else that. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, O oh God. Mom, your kids are image bearers of God Almighty. And this has huge imp implications that per as it pertains to life. For instance, where does life or when does life begin? Imago Dei is an abortion issue. When should life end? Imago Dei is a euthanasia issue. What is sexuality, personhood, and gender? It's all tied to Imago Dei. Created in the image of God, by God, and for God. He created them, male and female, he created them. What I just explained is foundational for a biblical worldview. Now lean in right here, lean in really closely. We must know that every line of thinking is based on or rests in a particular worldview. 
Whether you know it or not, you have a world of worldview. Some of you, your worldview has been formed by scripture. You were maybe raised in church, you were in Sunday school, you were taught God's word, or you sit in church every Sunday, you hear God's word, and then you have a quiet time and you open up God's word and you read God's word, and your worldview, your heart and your mind and your worldview is being conformed to the things of God, not to the things of the world. The world is those things outside of God. No, my heart, my mind is being conformed to the things of God. Some of you, your worldview was formed through education. Some of you went to a secular university with secular professors helping you have a worldview that they have or maybe that that university promotes. Is, is anybody with me right now? Are, are you with me? So, so moms and dads, remember this. When you send your kids off to that secular university, I'm just telling you, they're going to have the opportunity to have their worldview shaped by someone who is anti-God Antichrist. I don't mean they're the Antichrist, but, 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 they, but they have a view that is anti what God says. So, the, so your children are going to sit under those professors for three or four or five years, and their, their worldviews are going to be shaped. You've got you to decide, okay, but is their worldview already formed to the point where I can put them under those professors? I'm not telling you not to send them to a secular university. I'm just telling you what you're in for. So you've got to make sure that they are ready to have their minds shaped. Uh, impacted and hopefully they're formed and shaped even before they go some of you have had your minds and worldview shaped by by media and they're continuing to be shaped and formed by media that's why we've got to be cautious with our children with what media they're taking in because I can tell you for the most part most media most social media is not coming to you and to your children with a biblical worldview they're coming to shape your the hearts and minds of your kids with a secular humanistic worldview that's very progressive and are, how many of I do i have still listening to me i'm just curious i mean what what are you supposed to hear when you come to church you're supposed to hear the word of god and what the We just had the, the National Day of Prayer on Thursday, and we were on the courthouse steps in Douglas County. I thank God for Douglas County and Judge Bo. Just so thankful that we can still stand out on the steps in the public square and pray together and lift up the name of Jesus together. And one of the prayers was about the pastors in, of our county and the pastors of our churches being bold with the truth of God's word. So blame it on them. They're praying for me to be bold with God's word. What I just explained about, about worldview, I want you to understand worldview takes you someplace. There's an eventuality about worldview. There's an, an inevitabil inevitability. Did I say that right? Yes. You say all sorts of things when you get up here, but there's an inevitability about worldview, to every world. There's consequence to your worldview. Look what C.S. Lewis said. He said, the Christian and the materialist hold different beliefs about the universe. They can't both be right. The Christian worldview, materialist worldview. They can't both be right. The one who is wrong will act in a way which simply doesn't fit the real universe. Now you tell me, does God's way fit the universe that he created? Or is the secularist way that says man gets to decide? Ladies and gentlemen, the secularist way is not God's way. And you know that. God's way, God's will always fits the universe that he created. So it matters. It matters what we believe. And it's taking us somewhere. So if being made in God's image lies at the core of what it means to be human, I want to give you three things in the few minutes that I have remaining. Three things quickly, and then we're going to close. Number one, to be created in the image of God is to be relational. God teaches us this. God shows us this. There's an interesting use of plurality in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, when it says this. Then God said, said let us make man in our image after our likeness. Now, who's God talking about? 
He's talking about the, the triune God, God the Father, God the Son, Jesus Christ, and God the Holy Spirit. One God in three persons who know, who relate to one another, who love one another. So God's very essence is relational. Author Stephen R. Tracy said this, he said, by virtue of being made in God's image, humans have the capacity, longing, and need for intimate relationship based on the truth that God himself is a relational God who is in intimate relationship with his own divine being. We are cut from relational cloth. The very fact that we are instructed in scripture to love our neighbor implies that we need our neighbor. We need each other. We were created in his image for relationship. Secondly, to be created in the image of God is to rule. Hmm, is to rule. Genesis 1 reveals God to be creator and ruler over the whole creation. Look at verse 28. Verse, cha chapter 1, verse 20, and God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So when he recreates us in his image, the logic follows that man would have a measure of authority and rule over certain aspects of creation. That man, I'm not just talking about Christian believers here. I'm talking about man who was created in the image of God. So to work and keep it says that we are also to serve and the earth as well as to rule over it. God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it, Genesis 2.15. We are to serve and preserve the earth as well as to rule over it. Are you with me? Now, let's admit it. A lot of things have gone wrong including preserving the earth. But why is that? Because sin has distorted everything, including the image of God that we were created in. We're gonna talk more in the, in the next couple of weeks about the distortion of all of this and what the result has been. So created in the image of God, or Imago Dei, means we are to be relational and we are to have authority and to rule with care. Now, we're just given the foundation today. And then number three, to be created in the image of God is to represent and reflect him. This is my favorite one. To represent and reflect him. We understand the idea of a representative, right? If I can't be, be somewhere, I can send someone who knows me really well, and they can go and represent me. That, that happens sometimes here at our church. With a large church, multi-site church, sometimes I'll send pastors to go and represent me because I can't be in multiple places at one time. An ambassador does what? He represents his country. He goes to another country. He represents his country's authority. So in the same ways, we are meant to represent our ruler and king and do what? Advance his kingdom. Let me take this a little bit further. To be created in someone's likeness or image means that you see something of person A, you see the same thing in person B. Mom, let's take you and your kids, for example. Are you ready? Your biological kids may look like you. How many of you lift up your hand if you've ever had somebody say, one of your children looks like you? Raise your hand. Okay, well, most of you are lifting up your hand. How many of you have ever had somebody say, your, your son or your daughter acts like you? Be careful here now, okay? <laughs> they act like you, all right? And the reality of that is good and, and bad, yeah, yeah. Why? Because they're in your likeness. They're a reflection of you. They really represent you. That's why, that's why we called these parents a moment ago to model the way. Model the way. Let them see in you how to live their life and represent Christ. Have you ever sworn to yourself that you would never become like your mom? You don't have to raise your hand. Or I'll never, I'm never going to be my, like my dad. Only to find out, find out, yep, turned out just like him. In one aspect or another. Cindy's mom is here today, and she's wonderful, and I'm so glad my wife turned out like her. I love my mother-in-law. I say that in part because she's staying with us for two more weeks. <laughs> it's the same thing with God. 
Not that he's going to stay with us two more weeks, but, but that we, we, we are like him. When someone looks at us, when someone looks at us, they should see a reflection of God. They should see someone that lives in his likeness, that lives in a way that there's something so different about you. There's something about the way you, you talk. There's something about the way you walk. There's something about the way you tip servers. I am so tired of hearing that Christians are the worst tippers. I am so tired of hearing that. Not Chapel Hill people. We are the most generous tippers of any Christian in town. We reflect the generosity of God in this place and we take it out into the world. We reflect his love, we reflect his kindness, we reflect his servanthood. We reflect who Jesus is, the Son of God. But sometimes we, we fall short. Sometimes we're not reflecting God relationally. I hope that changes. Sometimes we're not reflecting God in our ruling or in the authority that he's given us and delegated to us. Sometimes we're not reflecting him in our representation of him. So where do things go wrong? This is where the distortion starts happening. It went wrong when man sinned. It went wrong when we were born into that sin nature. But thank God he had a plan for that. It's a divine redemption plan that we can see it all the way through the Old Testament, all the way into the New, New Testament. When Mary came and gave birth to a son, a perfect son without sin, who came and lived a life for 33 years and reflected the very image of God in the earth, reflected, came and lived as a Mago Day, came created in the very, not only as a, with a, with, not only as a person, but in, as a perfect person, sinless in every way and came and reflected God in the earth. And then he said, something's gotta to happen to change course here for the rest of humanity because they've all been born with a sin nature and they're all, gonna, they're all gonna die and spend eternity in hell. So God said, I've got a plan, son, you're my plan. Jesus, are you willing? Are you willing to take the sin of this whole group of people, this whole world? Are you willing to take the sin to the cross? because there's gonna be power that's gonna be released in the, in the blood on that cross. And the power that's released in the blood on the cross is gonna to flow to everyone who will simply believe that, that, that you are the Son of God and that I'm God. And boy, was it ever released on that day on Calvary. And they hung him on that cross and we just talked about it on Good Friday and we celebrated the resurrection on Easter Sunday, but they hung him on that cross and your sin was represented on that cross. Mom, every failure, every struggle, every pain, every disappointment was reflected on that cross. And today we get to identify what Jesus did on that cross so that we could all be free, so that we could all have new life, so that we could all represent and share it with those around us and our children and our grandchildren and those to come. That's the blessing. The sin, yes, the sin distorts Imago Dei, but the blood of Jesus restores Imago Dei. And today it's being restored in those hearts who will simply believe. Would you bow your heads with me right now because I think there's some restoration that needs to be done. I think there's some of us that might be carrying around sin and be, you've been, been carrying around a burden of guilt You've been carrying around a, a secular worldview, a mindset, and yet today, these words don't be conformed to the things of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Just ring in your spirit, I don't want to conform to this secular world, but I want my mind to be renewed today. And it can be, as you just begin to say that name, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There's something about the name of Jesus. There's something powerful about that substitutionary death that Jesus died. 
And he died so that we could be restored in relationship with him and begin to walk out this image of God that we've been created in. If you're here today and you know there's sin in your life, you know you're separated from God, mom, dad, single mom, student, young adult, this is your moment to just simply lift your hand and say, Pastor, I want my heart to be restored to the things of God. I want to begin to live my life in a, in a, as, in, with a biblical worldview. I want to begin to live my life in, the, in, the, in how I was created. Hands are already going up. I see hands going up. I want to live in such a way that people would look at me and say, there's something different. About, yeah, that's God in, in me. That's God's likeness on me. I was created in that. He wants to restore that to you today. On the count of three, slip up your hand. We're going to pray a simple prayer, and I believe it's a powerful prayer for you to pray. One, two, three. Slip up your hand all over this room right now. People online, hands are going up. Go ahead and lift it on up. Lift it on up. Now let's just praise the Lord for all these hands, dozens of hands going up right now. People saying yes to Jesus. Yes, I want to be made renewed. I want to be renewed. I want to be restored. Watching online right now, just say yes to Jesus. Yes to Jesus. Yes to Jesus. Type it in the chat. Yes, I say yes to Jesus. All right, let's just pray this together out loud. With your heads bowed and eyes closed. Just say it out loud. Let's all pray together. Dear Lord Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you came to restore me. I believe you came to make me a new person. I want to live out the image of God. I want to know who I am. And today I believe that I'm a child of God. I believe I was created in his image. And I believe God brings me clarity. So Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you that my sin was nailed to that cross. And today I identify with that act. And I receive the power, the washing and cleansing that's available through the cross. And I believe, Jesus, that you rose again on the third day. And today you release life. For all who believe, I believe, and I put my hope in you. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for helping me to follow you now. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Let's shout out loud and thank him for what he's done.